together as we begin this morning. Holy Father, we love you so much. Thank you for this day of worship, this time of communion with one another and with you, Lord. And we ask that at this time, Lord, you would calm and quiet our souls so that we could hear the message that comes from your word this morning. Lord, right now we are seeking to be the church, to be the congregation that we ought to be. And Lord, I ask that you would reveal to us the ways in which we can do that more fully each day. Help us to, to, to come together as one and to be your hands and feet in this neighborhood. Lord, for those who are sick and hurting in this congregation, I pray your blessing and your peace. And we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus without whom none of this would be possible, without whom we would have no hope. And we thank you for his sacrifice and that he rose again that we might do the same. It's in Christ's name that we pray this morning. Amen. Well, last week we followed in the footsteps of a journey from slavery to freedom, both in the history of Israel in the book of Exodus and in our own lives and in the Gospels. And we talked about hermit crabs. I introduced you to my long-lost friend, Captain Crab, who I believe may still be at large in the Metroplex, uh, so <laughs> be on the lookout. And we talked about the longing for home and this feeling that we have where we find ourselves on this journey toward a promised land where that harmony with God that once was in the garden will be again. And the wrongs of this world will be set right. And so last week our message was this. Do not lose heart and do not lose sight of the place where we are going. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set out before us. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. That was the message last week. Because this world is not our home. It is only a temporary dwelling place. Well, our message for this week is similar, but it's not the same. The message for this week is that this world is not our home, but it is our temporary dwelling place. And so what should we do as we journey toward that promised home? And how should we live in this place which is not our true and eternal home? but that is only home for now. Well, the story that I want to tell you this morning begins in the distant past, in 586 B.C. And yet, the message of this story for us today, I, I think it's just so timely and so important for College Hill in 2015, because this story that we're going to be looking at this morning begins to answer the question that we're asking this morning. How should we live in a place that is not our true home? And so we'll be reading this morning from Jeremiah, chapter 29, if you want to be turning there and preparing to follow along. We'll have it on the screens as well. But first, here's the situation. 586 B.C. was a turning point in the history of the people of Judah. You may know this already. In the time before 586 B.C., the, the people of Judah were living in the promised land. They were living in the land that God had promised to Abraham and to Moses so many years before them. And, and what we talked about last week, they had arrived in the land which they were promised. And they had been there for quite some time when 586 B.C. came along. And, and, and people like to talk and debate about how long of a time that was. To, to put it simply, more than 500 years, they had lived in this promised land. More than twice the amount of time that the United States of America has been in existence. They had lived in this promised land. And so when rumors began to spread about this new Babylonian army, that was growing in the east, this emerging world power, the people of Judah rested assured. They had been in battles before. They had struggled to keep their place in this promised land in Canaan, but by and large, they had never really lost their place. And so uh, they weren't too 
worried. This was, after all, the land that God had promised them. It was theirs by right of the covenant that they had with God. And so when these rumors began to spread about the Babylonians who were coming, the, this army that was growing in the east, the people of Judah rested assured. They said to themselves, we are in our promised land. The Lord will protect us in our promised land. But he doesn't. In 586, the Lord does not protect them. The people of Judah say to themselves, we have the temple of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will not let his temple fall, but he does. In 586, the temple falls. And so this covenant that Judah was banking on, this, this promise that they have been holding dear, to them it seems like it's been broken. But in reality, it was Judah themselves who broke the covenant. In reality, it was Judah themselves who had not kept up their ends of the deal, and so God warned them time and time again, watch out, you'd better get right. And then in 586, the day finally comes, and things go exactly as God said, that they would go through his prophet, Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. This is in the years before 586 B.C., Jeremiah says, or the Lord says through Jeremiah, do not trust in these deceptive words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, don't, don't put your faith in, in the walls of this temple while you're doing wrong. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that stand before me in this house and then say, we're safe? Only to go on doing these same things things, these same abominations, has this house, God's temple, become to you a den of robbers? So God says, watch out. I'm warning you. Repent now, or I will cast you out. Verse 15. But Judah doesn't listen. And in 586, God does exactly what he said he would do. He casts them out, his stubborn and unfaithful people. And the Babylonians come in and they destroy that temple. And the Babylonians come and they overrun that promised land. And, and they drag a broken and bewildered Judah into exile, away from their promised land. And this thing that was so unthinkable to them, that they couldn't even imagine how it could happen, becomes a reality. That's the context of Jeremiah 29. 586 B.C. has happened. The, the, the Jews have been carried away into exile, away from their home, and now they're wondering, what do we do next? How do we live in this place that is not really our home? And there's one more thing that you need to know about Jeremiah 29 before we dive into this text, and that's that there were other voices at that time in the exile, other people who were calling themselves God's prophets besides Jeremiah. And these people found it very easy and convenient to say, don't worry, this is only a flash in the pan. This is not going to last. In fact, one chapter earlier, chapter 28 of the book of Jeremiah, one of these prophets comes and he says, within two years from now, God will overthrow Babylon and you'll be back in your homeland Again, don't even unpack your suitcases. You're not going to be here for long. But Jeremiah, the Lord's prophet, says no. In chapter 29, he sends a letter to the exiles in Babylon, in that foreign land, away from their promised land, and he says, don't listen to the prophets who tell you this is just going to be a short time. Verse 8, he says, do not let the prophets who are among you deceive you. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, to their home. Don't be deceived, Jeremiah says. The punishment that you've been given is going to last a while. Only after 70 years will God bring you back from Babylon. And God will bring you back from Babylon. He will take you home. But it's going to take 
some time. And so how are you going to live in the place that you are calling home for now? That's where this story and this letter that Jeremiah sends into the people in exile is going. And that's why this letter is so interesting to me and that why I want to share it with you this morning because I think that there's something that we can learn from this story. I think there's a level of parallel here. No, we're not in exile being punished or, or, or receiving a, a punishment from God. But we are living, as we talked about last week, in a land which is not our true and everlasting home. We are living today in a land just like uh, the, the Jews, where our faith is becoming less and less of the majority. And we're asking ourselves the question, how should we live in this place, which is only home for now? Well, I believe the words of Jeremiah in chapter 29 can help us to understand how to do that. And so we begin in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And Jeremiah is about to tell us what we should do. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear more sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. This is a surprising message for the Jews who haven't even unpacked their suitcases yet. They're ready to go home at the first light. They're ready to get out of here. They think God's going to take care of this in an instant and they'll be back in their promised land. But Jeremiah says, build a home. Plant a garden. Settle down and start your family here. This may not be your true home, and it's not. But this is your home for now. And this is the verse. This is the next part that I really want you to see about this. Verse 7. Jeremiah says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray for the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Perhaps there's a word in that for us. Even in a place like Babylon, even in exile, even when you're far from your true home, God says, do what you can to bless the city where you are right now. Even in Babylon. Even in a place that they would not have wanted to call home at all. I love the language in that verse of seeking the welfare of the city in which you live. I, I wonder if that same message, if that same letter could not be addressed to us today in our situation. I wonder if that same calling is not issued to us this morning, that even though we are journeying toward a better place than this world has to offer right now, even still, while we are here, we have a responsibility to the city in which we live. We are called to seek the welfare of the city in which we live, to be a blessing to this city. And so the question that I have for us today is, at, at College Hill in 2015, what does it look like for us to seek the welfare of the city in which we live? What does it look like for us to be a blessing to the, the people right outside our doors in North Richland Hills, Texas, this day and this year? How does College Hill seek the welfare of this neighborhood? These are questions that we've been asking for a while and I've been asking as well. And i got to admit that in many ways I have more questions than I do answers when it comes to seeking the welfare of this city and how we do this. But I would like to share some ideas with you this morning as to how we get started. The first one is this. If we want to seek the welfare of this city, if we want College Hill to be a blessing to the community that we're in in North Richland Hills, as God has called us to be, then we need to learn to listen carefully. And I mean that in two ways, actually. It starts with becoming better listeners and with asking the right questions. 
Maybe, maybe what it takes is asking our neighbors or the people outside these doors, what can we do as a congregation to bless what you're doing here in this neighborhood? What can we do to bless your life? How can we be a blessing to you? I think it starts with learning the story of our neighborhood as told by the people in our neighborhood, becoming familiar with their hopes and with their dreams and with their cries and with their worries of the people that live right here. And then, all the while, we are listening to another voice, the voice of our God, as revealed to us in His Word, as He speaks to us in our lives, as He guides us by His Spirit. We listen to the voice of our neighborhood, and we listen to God's voice, and we try to find a way to bring those two voices into conversation together. That's the place that we start. And so once we've begun to listen and and to try to figure out what we can do, that's how we've got to move forward. So imagine with me for a moment how we do that. And maybe this will help us to do so. Uh, This is a map of our neighborhood. You can see College Hill right here is is in the middle with the red dot. And if you were to draw a circle around College Hill and you stretched out its borders two miles in every direction, this is what you would see. Uh, These are the schools that are within those two miles of our building. These are the apartments that are within two miles of where we are. And I know that schools and apartment complexes are just a fraction of what our community is, but can you imagine the stories and and the struggles and the hopes and, and the worries that are gathered in just those places? right here, outside our walls, within walking distance of our building. What if we could learn to listen carefully to the people that gather in these places? What if somehow we could communicate to the schools and to the apartment complexes in our neighborhood that we are listening to them, that we are their neighbors, and that we want to bless them, we care for them, and we are seeking to bless them in what we do? What if somehow we could demonstrate to to maybe one or two of the schools in our area that we care for them every single day, adopt them into our own family and care for them and tell them that we want to know their hurts, we want to know their dreams and hopes, we want to be there when they need us, that we're here to bless this city. But again, it starts with Listen, because we'll never know exactly what this community needs unless we take the time to listen and ask them. Anything else, any other plans we come up with or or, uh, programs we design will be just guessing if we're not listening first, listening to God's voice, listening to the voice of our neighborhood and bringing those two voices into conversation. And once we've done that, when we've begun to listen, then we begin as a congregation to love consistently. If we're going to reach anyone with the story of Jesus, we first got to show them the love of Jesus and do that convincingly and consistently. It's the only place to start. And so at College Hill, we've got to find ways to become a consistent presence and a faithful presence in our community. We can't just wait for people to come to us. It rarely works that way. We've got to find a way to go out and to be a part of people's lives if we really want to show them uh, the love of Jesus in a way that might change them. And so uh, the question is still how. How do we do this? How do we become that faithful presence in our community? And, And that's something that we're still trying to figure out and it's going to take time and it's going to take trial and effort and it's going to take all of us pulling together and and, and trying this to reach out and to be that presence in our community. But And so I want to know what you think. I want to know what ideas you have as you listen to the areas that you're plugged into already. I want to know what you think. I want to know what ideas you have and hopes you have and how you want to get involved. But I also want to share with you this morning 
a few early steps that we're already taking to trying to do this. And, and hopefully we can get together on this. I want to show you a few dates. You, you may want to write these down and, or put them on your calendar. They'll be coming out in your bulletin soon. The first date is August 22nd. This is the day of our school supply giveaway this year. And we're going to take a little bit of a different approach this year as we try to do our school supply giveaway. We're actually planning to partner with the city of North Richland Hills for an event that they're uh, starting at the Birdville Fine Arts and Athletic Complex called Refresh NRH. And basically what it is is that they have invited eight of the elementary and middle schools in Birdville ISD to come. If you're a part of their free and reduced lunch program, you're invited to come and get free school supplies, free eye exams, free haircuts, and free athletic physicals. And then the parents are asked to come along as well and they get information about drug and rehab addiction recoveries and, and food stamps and insurance and all the things that they may need to get back on their feet maybe will be available to them at this place. And so in other words, we've been asked to join in this. And there's going to be, uh, they're expecting 1,500 students, more than 4,000 people to walk through their doors on August 22nd. And we have at, we've been asked to be there and to be a presence and to tell them about College Hill. What better opportunity than this? And to help them to get the school supplies that they need to start out their year to be a presence, to have a chance to listen carefully, and to love at the same time. This is something that we're, going, we're not going to be the only ones putting this on. We're going to be working alongside some other people, other organizations, and other churches as well, which is exciting because we can reach more people that way. And it's kind of like things that we've done in the past with College Hill. It's kind of like when we've had a presence or a representation at the State Fair or at the Holiday Heights Fall Festival where we've been a part of something bigger in order that we might share the love of Jesus and let people know that we're here and that we're listening. So this is an opportunity that I think we just can't pass up. Our whole neighborhood is going to be there, whether we're there or not. The question is, will we be there? And I hope that we will. And so, if you're interested in this, the next date you need to know is August 2nd. That's a week from today. Next Sunday, we're going to be having a, a detailed meeting on how we can get involved in this effort. This, this first step into being a presence in our community. And so, I hope you'll stay after morning services. And we'll go straight to the fellowship hall. We won't have lunch because you won't need it. It'll be quick. And we'll just get this going. And you can have a chance to learn more about this and, and, and sign up to help in, in various ways. So put that on your calendar as well. And then one more while we're at it is August 30th, the date of our fifth Sunday. Uh, we always gather together for a lunch on the fifth Sunday. And we hope that you'll come to that again this time. And we're going to do things a little bit differently. Because while you eat your lunch and after we spend a little bit of time fellowshipping, we're going to talk about it. Concrete ways, specific ways, we're going to dream together as to how we can reach this community, how we can listen more closely, and how we can love more consistently together. And I want to hear what you think. I want to hear what you're thinking about and how you want to get plugged in into this outreach that we so desperately need. I know this is a lot of information, and it's probably not... Uh, the sermon that you might expect this morning, and uh, maybe, maybe expect something different. Um, but I want you to know that we are, we are trying. We need, to, we need to be trying, and we are trying, to be a presence in this community. There's a question that I ask myself quite a lot, especially recently. Uh, it's a question that I just can't seem to shape, one that... Uh, motivates a lot of my time and energy right now. I hope you'll consider it with me this morning. And that is, if College Hill closed its doors tomorrow, what sort of impact would that have on our neighborhood? If College Hill closed its doors tomorrow, would anyone in our neighborhood know or care? That's a question that I keep coming back to because it motivates me. It challenges me. And it's a question that we can't afford to ignore. 
And so here's the last date that I want to share with you this morning. You can write it down if you want. July 26, 2016. That's one year from today at the Tuesday. And what I want you to think about is, what if one year from today, College Hill closed its doors? What impact would that have on its, our neighborhood? What if one year from today, we closed our doors? Would anyone in this neighborhood know or, or care? The answer to that question is yet to be seen. But I hope and I pray that in the next year's time, we will work together to seek the welfare of the city that we live in. That we will listen to the hopes and the cries and the worries and the dreams of our neighborhood and that we will share the love that God has given to us with the people right here in this area. And if we do that, I pray that we will make a lasting impression on this neighborhood, on this city in which we live. And not just for ourselves, of course not. But for the sake of the one who has done so much in our lives. For the one who's done so much for us. This world is not our home. We are surely called to a better country. And we long for the day in which we will see it. But while we are here, we are just as surely called to bless our home away from home, if you will. The city in which we live. And so I pray that we will do that. That we will seek to do that. That we will seek the welfare of our city with all of our hearts. And that we'll do it together. This morning we want to offer an invitation. This invitation is open for everyone. It's open for all, as it always is. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, if you've never been baptized into Christ and you're considering uh, that decision today to be washed free of your sins, we want you to do that today. The invitation is for you. If you're realizing today that you've neglected your calling to listen and to love, well, you're not alone. We're working on this together and we want to help you to do that. We want to pray for you this morning. We want to be there for you today. If you have any needs of the church this morning,